good afternoon, and good afternoon and greetings to our online audience as well. Uh, I'm really thrilled to be able to welcome all of you here for a special edition of the Advance with Africa initiative uh, in collaboration with the President's Advisory Council for African Diaspora Engagement. My name is Kendra Gaither, and I'm pleased to serve as the President of the U.S. Africa Business Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which is our hub for advancing trade and investment relationships um, with the nations of Africa and U.S. business. We're really pleased to be here in Atlanta today, um, which is really a homecoming in many ways for this initiative, because we launched the Advance with Africa program here in Atlanta uh, 18 months ago. And obviously, we're here today because of the President's Advisory Council for African Diaspora Engagement, which is uh, initiating its official work. And we're thrilled to be able to uh, collaborate on our shared uh, purpose uh, and interest in expanding the trade, investment, and economic relations uh, between the United States and the nations of Africa. And there's no better city for that conversation than the city of Atlanta, which has been, uh, quite frankly, at the center of U.S. connectivity with the world um, and has been increasing its role and its uh, prominence in connecting with the continent. So we're thrilled to be able to facilitate today's conversation, which will take place through a series of keynotes, panels, interactive discussions that will hopefully uh, share what, what we know and we think about every day in our work, which is that uh, Africa is today and Africa is the future. And it is incumbent upon us uh, as leaders in industry, as leaders, um, civic leaders, um, as leaders in government, uh, to really uh, work in tandem to build that collaboration. And numbers that, that sort of guide and govern and, and drive us to do what we do really are taken from the official statistics of the United States. Um, if you look at what the Small Business Administration has highlighted, 99% uh, of the, the business community in the United States is actually driven by small business. They're small business leaders. They're small and medium enterprises. They're entrepreneurs and founders like many of you in this room. I mean, when we look at how the United States grows and grows its partnerships, it's through business. It's through the commercial connections that are forged. And when you look at who is leading that export and investment conversation, it's small business. And SBA reports that 97% of all exports that leave the United States are generated by small and medium enterprises. But here's the challenge that we wrestle with at the U.S. Africa Business Center. When you look at the data, 43% of small businesses that are connecting with the world are connecting with Canada, Mexico, the United Kingdom, and Japan. So it really is for us a call to action when we think about that there are 1.4 billion people on the continent, which is set to double uh, by 2050. When we think about the ingenuity, the dynamism that's coming from the continent that has set trends in how we use our cell phones, that is at the center of how we connect with the world, um, and yet we're not there, we're not present. Um, it really is a call to action for us as a center that's focused on convening the world as the world's largest business association to make sure that we are connecting with organizations and institutions that are looking to grow the collaboration. And so we're thrilled to, to not only be joined by the President's Advisory Council for African Diaspora Investment, which has as part of its mandate that precise goal, but also to work with all of you to ensure that as we continue to build um, opportunities that we're providing you with resources, insights, and examples um, of what has been done before and that we can be informed by that as we go forward. Uh, so with that, I'd like to uh, call up to the stage um, our distinguished council member from the President's Advisory Council for African Diaspora Engagement, who's been leading a lot of the trade investment conversation, Ms. Roslyn Brewer, who will give us welcome remarks on behalf of the council. Thank you, Kendra. So uh, welcome, everyone. And uh, we have been in full session today, so this is the final part of our day. So we're going to try and keep the energy up. But I thought I'd start, first of all, by making sure that all of us, as we get together, understand what really is PAC-Aid? What have we been charged to do? Where are we now? And then let's have some discussions about what we can do together. And I will just tell you that just from the beginning of today, 
it's really exciting to see that Atlanta is becoming a really crucial part of what could come out of this global opportunity grounded right here in Atlanta. We were joined by the mayor earlier this morning, and um, he gave some great remarks and reminded us the work that he's done to bring things like Ethiopian Airlines to this region, which has been amazing. And then Ambassador Andrew Young shared his experience of doing work in Africa. So we've had a big morning. I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, the chair of PAC-AID. So joining us as our chair of PAC-AID is Bishop Sylvester Beeman. And then I'd like all the members of PAC-AID to stand so that at least you all will see the faces. We'll get into names at, at some point. And then joining us from uh, the White House is Denise. Please stand up, Denise, and say hello. She's the one who keeps us going and rallies us and connects us back to the administration. So let's talk about what is PAC-AID. So December 13, 2022. Uh, President Biden signed an executive order, and that executive order was to establish the President's Advisory Council on the African Diaspora Engagement in the United States. And this is the Advisory Council to advise the President through the Secretary of State on certain strategies, and I'll talk about those in just a minute. Now, there's 12 members, so just 12 of us are rallying this call, but we represent and reflect the diversity of the African diaspora from African American and African immigrant communities. So that's the different here, difference here is that we're trying to bridge, bridge those two together. And I will tell you that this includes individuals who have distinguished themselves in government, sports, creative industries, business, academia, social work, and faith-based activities. So we're hitting on every discipline. The five uh, really sort of um, what I will call our engagement principles. The first one is around strengthening cultural, social, political, and economic ties between African communities, the global African diaspora, and the United States. Secondly, to address challenges and opportunities to advance inclusion, belonging, and public awareness of the diversity, accomplishments, culture, and history of the African diaspora. Third is to increase public and private sector collaboration and community involvement in improving the socioeconomic well-being of African diaspora communities. Fourth, to increase the participation of members of the African diasporas in the U.S. with regard to trade investment, economic growth, development programs all relating to Africa, and then finally, strengthen educational ties and exchanges, which is why it's been so important that this morning session was held at the Spelman College, I'll just say. <laughs> so um, so t what do we want to do this afternoon? Um, the objectives of this particular event um, is to promote and increase economic engagement. Many of you all, um, I know several of you all in this room are entrepreneurs interested in doing business in Africa, wondering how to make that happen. Are there big issues blocking the work that you need to do? Are there small tactics, things like, is it easy to um, create a, a supply chain between the U.S. and some African uh, communities? And so we're here to talk about the big and the small, but we're here to absolutely get work done. And we know that it's gonna come out of partnerships, both public and private, so these discussions are critical. And we take them seriously because we're going to have to provide a report back to the President of the United States in terms of where we think investment should go. The key metrics for success will be measured by the number of businesses engaged as this event serves as an awareness and education campaign. So think of it in terms of we're campaigning to understand what the needs are and aimed at highlighting the economic significance of the diaspora and the vast potential of African markets. And we want to do this by empowering businesses with knowledge and fostering connections. We aim to catalyze really meaningful connections and relationships. So I'm grateful for you all being here. I want us to have good conversations. It's important that we meet and connect, and it's important that we don't leave this room until we fully understand what we can all do together. So I'm glad you're here, and thank you for joining us. Thank you, Roz, for those inspiring remarks and for uh, making sure that we understand the work that you all are called to do as a council. Um, 
I'd like to follow uh, actually Raz's lead and uh, acknowledge some members in the audience that we are honored to be joined with today. Uh, we're joined by distinguished ambassadors, one of whom you'll hear from uh, uh, during a panel discussion, as well as members of the African Diplomatic Corps. We're honored to be joined uh, with honorable leaders from the Georgia Africa Legislative Caucus. Uh, we're joined here by our partners at the Georgia Chamber and affiliated chambers. I um, mean, we wanna offer a special thanks to our sponsoring partners, DLA Piper and The Gathering Spot, um, and taking this opportunity to congratulate The Gathering Spot on their eighth anniversary. Um, no better place in which to convene this conversation. Um, Obviously, we are very thrilled to have with us uh, officials uh, and leaders from the business community, and I'm honored to bring before you uh, Ms. Alreen Barr, who is the Senior Director for the Office of Public and International Affairs for Hartsville-Jackson Atlanta International Airport um, to give remarks on behalf of the City of Atlanta. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. That's much better. Thank you. My name is Alreen Barr, and I am serve as a senior director for the Office of Public and International Affairs at Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport, the world's busiest and most efficient airport. On behalf of the 61st mayor for Atlanta, the Honorable Andre Dickens, Hartsfield Jackson Atlanta International Airport general manager, Ballroom B.B. Odari and the 63,000 team members at ATL. I welcome you to Atlanta and under the leadership of Mayor Dickens, the city of Atlanta continues its rich history of fostering economic engagement with many countries across Africa. Today, Atlanta is truly an international hub with more than 70 consulates 38 binational chambers of commerce, and we are a region where more than one million residents are foreign born. It is this rich diversity that makes Metro Atlanta and Hartsfield Jackson not just a center for commerce, but a crossroads for cultural exchange as well. It is this rich environment that the Metro Atlanta region is ripe for increasing business opportunities and partnerships in Africa. Mayor Dickens believes that deepening and enriching our relationships with African nations strengthens his goal of moving Atlanta forward. Likewise, Hartsfield Jackson General Manager Biodari has made increasing air service to the continent a priority. I was privileged last May to be on the inaugural Ethiopian Airlines flight from Addis Ababa to ATL with Mayor Dickens and others. In recent years, the city of Atlanta and the airport have engaged African countries in many mutually beneficial partnerships. One of our signature partnerships is our sister airport agreement. These agreements consistently yield significant progress, particularly through the establishment of working groups covering areas such as capacity building, public safety and security, cargo, supply chain logistics, customer experience, human trafficking, and non-aeronautical revenue streams. We have enjoyed these partnerships with Cote d'Ivoire, Nigeria, and Liberia. This past fall, I had the privilege to travel to Namibia with General Manager Biodari, where we put in place a path for a sister airport agreement especially focused on increasing cargo infrastructure. We anticipate this partnership, along with a separate agreement with South Africa, being finalized this summer. Did I mention that ATL also currently provides direct flights to South Africa and Nigeria? Hartsfield Jackson has also been engaged in Airports Council International's Developing Nations Assistance Program. Over the years, we have hosted hundreds of managers from African airports where we shared our expertise and traded best practices on human trafficking, landside, airside, terminal operations, customer service, non-aeronautical revenue streams, and air service development. We also have hosted participants from the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders. 
These young people have a track record of promoting innovation and making a positive impact in their communities and countries. During their July visit, these 25 to 35 year old aspiring African leaders received an airport overview, learned about the ATL customer experience, heard remarks by United Nations ambassador and consultant, April Ripley, and participated in the airside tour. A year ago, ATL leaders hosted a 20 member delegation of government and private aviation leadership from East and Southern Africa as part of a reverse trade mission. The group learned about technology, services, and best practices to support modernizing their airports and improving security. The event was organized by the U.S. Trade and Development Agency and Business Council for Understanding. As you can see, Mayor Dickens and General Manager Biodari are helping to make Ambassador Andrew Young's dream of Atlanta becoming the gateway to Africa a reality. While you are here, we hope you take some time to enjoy the attractions and activities that make Atlanta the shining city on the hill for the South. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for having me. Thank you so much for that, Aureen. And now that you've told us how Atlanta is the gateway to the continent, we'll get a chance to talk about Africa as a destination for investment and export in a conversation that will be led by our senior advisor to the U.S. Africa Business Center, Ms. Dana Banks. Please join me in welcoming Dana and our panel to the stage. Good afternoon, everyone. All right, we're going to keep the energy up, right? So my name is Dana Banks, and as Kendra mentioned, I am the senior advisor to the U.S. Africa Business Center at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. But before this role, I was the senior director for Africa at the National Security Council and the coordinator of the 2022 uh, African Leaders Summit that President Biden hosted and where the PAC ADE was announced. And so to see the PAC ADE come from uh, an idea, from a, from a concept, to see it come into reality, and to hear, uh, to be present for the first meeting today is not only inspirational, motivational, but it's, it's also just a realization that if we come together, if we work hard, and we move to action, we can move forward on creating shared prosperity between the United States and the continent of Africa. And so I also want to thank Denise Warren Manti as well, because she was right by my side when we, <laughs> when we uh, incepted that. So thank you, Denise. I'm going to call up our distinguished panelists so we can get started with our first panel. Um, but I invite those of you here in the audience, if you scan the QR code on your cards, you can read the bios, the full bios of our panelists. First, we have C.D. Glenn, who is a council member and also president of the PepsiCo Foundation and Global Head of Social Impact for PepsiCo. <laughs> Next, we have His Excellency, the Honorable Alfredo Fabial Nvunga, uh, Ambassador of Mozambique to the United States. Ambassador Nvunga. <laughs> and last but not least, we have Brandon Bradford, Director of Public Engagement from the U.S. Trade and Development Agency. Sorry, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that I'm also a 1997 graduate of Spelman College and really so pleased to be back here in Atlanta, Dr. Gale and Roz. Um, yes, this makes my heart full. <laughs> so um, question for all the panelists, and what I will do is I will ask you to just give a brief introduction of yourselves as you answer the question. Can you talk about the opportunities that U.S. businesses, particularly dias diaspora-led businesses, can expect as they seek to forge greater business opportunities on the continent of Africa. CD, over to you. All right, thank you, Dana, and thank you to the U.S. Chamber Africa Business Center. Thank you for having us, Dana. Thank you for your leadership. 
which brought into conceptualization of the PACT um, aid. It's just your leadership is amazing, and I'd like to have calling you a friend. Thank you. Um, you know, this is, that's a really great question, and I think we have to sort of think about Africa in a way that changes the narrative. So Africa historically has been sort of a problem to solve for the rest of the world, if you will. And now we're looking at this as an opportunity to seize. And I think the opportunities are endless, truly endless. 1.2 billion opportunities because we look at every individual on the continent as an Africa, have an opportunity to do more and for them to be more. So the question is sort of a loaded question in terms of what what uh, opportunities are there for trade and investment for business i spent my entire career as a little bit of background my entire career dedicated to africa and africa's people if you will and that has run different industries from being a peace corps volunteer in south africa in the early 90s to now leading what is the u.s's largest food and beverage company and uh, the second largest in the world at, at pepsico and we make 60 percent of our of our funding um, doesn't come from the, the cola wars. I'm in Atlanta, so I think about the cola wars, Pepsi versus, versus Coke, 60% of our entire business is on, is on the food side of, of the value chain, if you will. And that would be brands that you may be familiar with, but think about Lay's or think about Quaker Oats, and then think about a lot of toes, Doritos, Cheetos, <laughs> Tostitos, Fritos, a lot of toes in our portfolio. But those, those brands, they represent brands, yes, but they also rep represent investment opportunities. And so in 2019, um, PepsiCo bought uh, Africa's largest food and beverage company, which is, which is Pioneer Foods. And so the future of our company is based upon Africa and African uh, supply and, and demand, particularly in the food sector. So I look at agriculture and agricultural investment in Africa a lot. You know, those Lay's potato chips are potatoes. Those Doritos, they come from corn. Those oats come from Quaker Oats and all the other products. And if you spent time in Africa and Southern Africa and you've ever had Simba chips or you had um, you know, White Star flour or any number of things on the continent. So when I look at opportunities from a biz big business but also a social impact standpoint, and I think about challenges in terms of climate resilience, the future of our company is based upon not only African production, but also really building the resilience of African enterprises and African entrepreneurs to climate change. So not only a future that's bright in terms of the workforce, but a future that really is a climate smart, smart future. So I'll just close by saying, you know, when we look at opportunities across the board in terms of the private sector investment, it is about investing in Africa and her people. Yes, the natural resources are there, but at, at the end of the day, it's about the African ingenuity. And so whether it's agriculture or the agricultural food system, writ large, it's really a future where a company such as ours, it's a global company, is literally in the hands of Africans and their ingenuity and their ability to take technological revolutions and to do more with that. So we as a company can invest in those individuals to really be a bigger and uh, better uh, company that has great products, but that really is poised for future investment in terms of people and the planet. So it is about investing in Africa, but it's also about invest investing in our own future by investing in Africa. So it's something that's mutually inclusive as we think about the future of American businesses and the future of Africa, they're mutually intertwined. And so I'm really um, excited about conversations such as this. I'm excited that the US government has prioritized not only Africa, but the African diaspora as a part of that solution so that we are not left behind, that we are a part of the opportunities that we will seize by investing in Africa and her people. Thank you. Thank you, CD. Indeed, innovation and entrepreneurship is, abounds on the continent and offers investors even more hope and confidence in investing on the continent. So Ambassador Mvunga, I pose you the same question. Can you talk about opportunities that US businesses, particularly diaspora businesses, perhaps can find uh, in Mozambique? And, and what, do, what should they expect there? Thank you so much. Um, my name is Alfred Nuvunga, the ambassador of Mozambique in US. You will notice a difference between me and Glenn. He's a very fast speaker, a, a slow one, so you will slow the pace because I don't have that speed to say so many words in a meeting, in a minute, I mean. Uh, but I wanted to also to thank uh, uh, the uh, U.S. Africa uh, Business Center in U.S. Chamber of Commerce for convening this meeting and for particularly inviting us, Mozambique, 
It's such an honor to be here and uh, discuss the future of Africa in terms of Africa as a destination for uh, export and investment, but most particularly looking into the uh, uh, progress of Africa. I'm so happy to look into uh, the, the topic there. In three words, it says a lot, advance with, with Africa. And that uh, is, is, is something that I thought, okay, let's look not only to the opportunities of doing business in Africa, but uh, more than that, how can we advance uh, you, uh, USA, how can you advance with us uh, in, 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 in Africa as a whole? One of the uh, things, let me start with uh, a, a conversation. Uh, I will be almost one year in DC. I arrived last year in April. Uh, whenever we talk in uh, gatherings like this, the first thing people ask, oh, oh yeah, where are you from? And say, okay, Mozambique. And say, yeah, where is that? I try to explain. Uh, and you can see that some of them, they don't really get geographic location of Mozambique and say, but how far is it from here uh, flying? <laughs> then I say, okay, uh, if you skip uh, the layover somewhere in Africa now, I normally travel to Addis, you have something like 18 hours. And then they say, wow, it's too far. <laughs> this is too far. And generally people put it that way. I think this is the first barrier we have to break. Not looking at Africa or any destination in Africa as a too far destination. If we have that mindset, then we won't see all the opportunities that are there. Because the opportunities are there, uh, the inputs, uh, people, uh, everything is in there. This, I don't wanna go through what uh, uh, Glenn has said, uh, which I fully agree with, all those uh, resources are there in terms of minerals, uh, uh, agricultural products, uh, even in the area of IT, uh, digital market is growing, the population is there, is growing, and all what you need to do business is there. In introductory remarks, uh, uh, Kendra Gaita uh, referred to the fact that uh, despite all these avenues that we have, uh, you see that uh, the business with Africa is not evolving that much. The destinations are the nearby uh, surrounding. This is why I remember the, the, the rhetoric I have when I have a conversation is too far, it's too far. I think the first barrier to break is the distance because the distance doesn't mean anything, especially today that you are having all these very, very fast aircraft and comfortable. And even if the flight is not comfortable, when you land in Africa, then you'll relax and uh, really exhaust all the tire, tire some moments that you might be having and boring moments you might be have in, 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 in your flight. So let's go closer to Africa. I'm happy that uh, the diaspora is the bridging. African diaspora and, uh, and Afro descendants here in US are brought in as the bridging point. Uh, this is something, I don't know if I should bring it now or you want me to discuss it today. Put a pin in that. Don't forget your point. I will circle back to you. I want to get to Brandon, okay. but I, I'm going to just About briefly. About the opportunity. I joined Glenn <laughs> on so many opportunity, opportunities in Africa, but I just bring this barrier that is often there. Let's break it and move. And since I'm slow uh, speaking person, I think my time elapses even before I finish all my conversation. So I'll stop there. <laughs> Not at all, Honorable Ambassador. Thank you so much for that. So just to summarize, I think what you're saying and what we heard certainly earlier from Alreen is don't be discouraged by the distance. We now have a direct flight from Atlanta to Addis Ababa. You can get to Mozambique through Addis. Again, if, if, you, wanna, if you really want to make the effort, if you want to go where the opportunities are, you can advance with Africa and don't let the distance stop you, right? So lastly, Brandon, to you. All right, Dana, thank you for having uh, U.S. Trade and Development, and thank you, U.S. Chamber, um, and thank you for the President's uh, uh, Advisory Council on African uh, Diaspora Engagement, uh, for having U.S. Uh, 
TDA to be here. So I'm going to say US TDA a few times, but when, when you hear that, I want you to think about infrastructure. And that's, you know, the opportunity that my organization works on every day in Africa. Um, so when we, when we say infrastructure, we're just thinking about transportation. Um, we're thinking about clean energy, healthcare, and digital. Um, and so my organization works hard to bring those opportunities to, right to the doorstep of U.S. businesses. Um, so, you know, when um, Ms. Barr talked about the reverse trade mi mission that the uh, uh, East Al African delegation um, came here to Atlanta to see the airport. Um, that was USTDA. That was U USTDA um, bringing business right here to Atlanta. Um, you know, there's opportunities um, not just for airports, but for healthcare infrastructure. Um, you know, we we do a lot of feasibility studies for um, hospital exp uh, expansion and and also to um, telehealth. So when you hear USTDA, think about infrastructure, um, know that there are opportunities, and let me plug our website because I want you to get those opportunities. Um, that's just USTDA.gov. Um, right there you can find where we do, you know, we'll have a list of reverse trade missions. Some come to Atlanta, some come to Houston, Boston, throughout the, throughout the nation. So uh, when I say USTDA, I want you to think about your infrastructure friends. I want you to refer them uh, uh, to us because the same work that you are doing here, um, it will be an opportunity for you to do it globally. Excellent. Thank you, Brandon. I think we got, we got the website, but you can say it a few more times when I circle yeah. back to you. And I would be remiss also if I didn't mention, we um, had anticipated that uh, Mimi Alamayu, who's also a PAC AD council member, would join us. But unfortunately, uh, she had to, to take a flight uh, back to DC. But I'm, I'm fully aware that I'm the only woman on this panel. But that does not mean that it's not space for or women. Led by you. Or led You're by led me. You. That's right. OK. I'm going to take that framing. But there are, cer there are certainly opportunities for women, um, and minority, and diaspora-led businesses on the continent. I think we'll get into that in the next um, panel. So CD, I'll turn back to you. Um, throughout most of your career, you worked um, and focused on bridging the gap between underserved communities in Africa while providing the necessary tools to access greater economic opportunity, particularly for young entrepreneurs. Can you talk about some of the challenges that African entrepreneurs have faced in gaining access to the US private sector and how they might be mitigated? Thank you, thank you for the question. I think I'm, I wanna start by sort of reflecting on some of what the ambassador said. There are two phrases or two statements there, words there that are really important. So one, he talked about um, the distance, and the other was sort of familiarity. And so when I look out into this audience, and I think about the African diaspora engagement mandate that we have, it's really to break down those two, two things. The distance, and that most people here have been there. They've been to those far-reaching places that take 18 hours or whatever it may be in Africa. So we already have an advantage because these places aren't far to us because we've been there before. And then there's the narrative around the, the, the lack of familiarity. So it's far away and it's scary. It's Africa. So it's not scary to us because we're familiar with Africa. And so I definitely want to, before I answer the question, just applaud even the conceptualization of how and the competitive advantage that we have as those in the diaspora to Africa to invest in Africa. Because there, there are places that aren't far away to, uh, to us and there are places that are not unfamiliar to us. And so I just wanted you to reflect on that, that this is a moment in time that we have a true competitive advantage in terms of a new market. We don't think about Asia and China as being far away. No one in, in the U.S. business has been going to these places, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. So they're not far away. And these are places also where we don't speak the quote unquote same language, but we find a way as, as American investors. We find a way to go to Asia or to other far-reaching places. And Africa, for some reason, is a little bit too far, a little bit too distant, a little bit too unfamiliar. But this is our moment, and this is our time to really take advantage, because we do have an advantage, because these places aren't far away, and they're not unfamiliar, and they are familiar to us. So, you know, I spent my, my career focused on African enterprises and African entrepreneurs from, again, from the nonprofit sector, 
from the government sector in the, in the Peace Corps. Um, I mean, the government sector, yeah, work, working for the Peace Corps, the philanthropic sector with the Rockefeller Foundation, and now in, in corporate America. And the barriers for Africa's growth and development um, have, have, have been there and are there. And they're really ex exasperated with youth young people who, who really are looking for opportunities to be a part of something bigger than themselves, who are looking at opportunities to develop and grow and do something different from their parents. And some of those challenges are real. I mean, there's limited networks. Entrepreneurship, in general, is a lonely business. You start off as an, as a, and I'm looking at Rama, right, who I'm sure we'll hear from later, or we'll, you, you'll, you'll read about her, whether you, you don't hear from her directly. But you know, entrepreneurship is one of those places where you have an, you, you have an idea, and you yourself sort of believe in that, and you're trying to rally others to join you. So the limited networks are exacerbated for young people in Africa who really want to develop, grow, and scale a business because you're starting out as an individual. So that's a barrier in and of itself in terms of job creation at, on an individual level for young, for young people. The limited access to funding, it's always the challenge in the US. They talk about friends and family. Well, if your friends are broken, your family is broken, you're in the continent of Africa, it's really rough. So where is that money going, going to come from? So the limitations around capital are real, regulatory barriers in terms of some of the hardest places in the world to start businesses. It, you know, you've stacked up against you. And then just the realities around some of the cultural differences and understanding different markets and different market nuances. So I don't want to underestimate the, the challenges of starting, developing, scaling a business in Africa. But there are things that I call sort of the four C's that we all need to focus on that can really help develop, grow, and scale some of these businesses and help them on their way in these, uh, these African entrepreneurs and these African enterprises. So the first, obviously, is access to capital and really thinking about ways in which to make that capital more available, early stage capital, de-risking capital, capital that can go directly into the hand of entrepreneurs. Um, there's, a, there's a government agency, also a small government agency, Brandon, like USGDA. There's the US African Development Foundation, which focuses on African enterprises, African entrepreneurs, small scale grant startup funding that can really help provide that access to capital. But it's a real inhibitor, but that capital is really important. And then there's, there's these young African entrepreneurs, they all have the will, they want to. They have that want to, that drive, but do they have the skill? So the will is only half the battle. You need the skill and that capacity building support, the business advisory, the business training, the business mentorship is critical. So they have the will, but can we help them get the skill to develop, to grow, to scale? It's something that is a real focus and that's that capacity building. Then they need connections. They really need connections to one another. I was um, you know, fortunate to be involved when I was in government on the YALI program. And the YALI program was great in that it selected Africa's best and brightest to come to the US. And, but when they went back home, there were challenges. And so in the infinite wisdom of USAID and others, they created regional leadership centers. So all of those entrepreneurs or those, those uh, young leaders, when they went back home, they created a network. And now you have WhatsApp groups and you have Facebook groups and you have um, Instagram groups with thousands of African young entrepreneurs throughout the continent to create these connections because, again, you want to let entrepreneurship not be a lonely business but to, to be collective impact. And so the connections are really, really critical and it's connecting with one another. So that's sort of the third C. And the last one I would say is sort of collaboration. And this is collaboration when the private sector, such as a big business, whether it's PepsiCo or others, is really collaborating and looking at small and medium-sized enterprises or early stage entrepreneurs as true partners in your business. And we know, as we think about our business on the African continent, we want to develop, we want to grow, we want to scale, we want to do more in Africa, but we won't do it in spite or, or to the chagrin of small businesses. We're going to incorporate small businesses into our supply chain. We're going to incorporate small businesses in terms of what we're doing throughout the continent. So there's a real collaboration and connection that big business can have with African entrepreneurs and it's supporting things like incubators, like business accelerators, um, ways in which we can really have real collaborative relationships with small and medium sized enterprises and micro enterprises. So the, rea the challenges are real, but they're not insurmountable and they're not so different than in other places. If we figured it out in Silicon Valley, let's figure it out in Kenya, the Silicon Savannah. Let's really take the ingenuity that really developed um, mobile money all of us right now, and some it's you're tapping, you're using mobile money, that started, literally started 
in Africa. So that African ingenuity is real, but it takes investment, it takes collaboration, it takes connections, and it really takes intentionality. And so business, American business, thinking about investing in Africa, it's not a quick win. It's gonna be something that we have to be committed to for the long term. But the, real, the realities around big business is big, big business is not short term. It's not short term like the government. I, I'm a former government official, I get it. But government does operate on election cycles. So you got four years or eight years, and those initiatives can go away. That's the reality of a lot of this. USAID funding, three to five year programs in development. When you're investing with the private sector, you're talking about decades. You're talking about centuries. We don't, when we enter a market, we don't want to go away. We want to be there and be indelible to the development and growth of those communities because if those communities thrive, if those entrepreneurs thrive, then business thrives. So it's a really different model and I think you know, it's no longer that the private sector is a nice to have when we think about development in Africa, when we think about entrepreneurship development in Africa, the private sector needs to be a partner. You need to be pushing us, pushing the private sector to do more, to be more, to really collaborate with small business, with entrepreneurs, and I'm proud to be on the stage. I'm proud to lead um, a division within a big corporation that's committed to developing, growing, and scaling African enterprises for ourselves, but also for the continent of Africa. I mean, wonderful. That I mean, thank you, CD. So the four C's. If you take away the most, if you can take away just that, they need they need capital, they need capacity in terms of upskilling. They need connections and they need collaboration. So these are the ways in which you can mitigate some of the challenges that entrepreneurs on the continent face when trying to access the US market. Ambassador Nvunga, so I'm, I'm circling back to you. You are currently the co-chair of the African Diplomatic Corps uh, economic cluster. Can you share with the audience how the Mozambican government, as an example, um, promotes trade and investment particularly for American inve investors? And what are the key sectors that they can hope to uh, invest in? Thank you. Uh, the, the way the question is, is, is put, it's is good because it's talk about Africa and currently Mozambique, uh, together with the United Republic of Tanzania, we are the co-chair for the economic development community within the African Diplomatic Corps, uh, the broader part of it, and then uh, take Mozambique as an African country. What are we doing? I would start uh, with the broader side of it uh, before going to Mozambique. Regionally, both in SADC, which is Southern Africa uh, Development Community, and also at the level of AU, there are a number of uh, discussions around reforms that could be uh, or that are put in place uh, to attract investment. And uh, you have that in a coordinated manner, but the way, uh, the pace in which these reforms are going it depends, varies from country to country. In Mozambique, uh, the reforms came in we, what we call the accelerated uh, program uh, to, for, for the economic recovery uh, with 20 different measures. One of them, which I think is very important, and the implementation started last year in May, it's gonna be one year now, and the assessment for the first six months is positive, is the wave uh, of visas for uh, US uh, nationals for tourism and business before the process was a little bit delayed because of the, uh, the visa uh, process in itself. Now uh, you can just uh, take your passport and just take your, 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 your put yourself in a flight. Uh, now I understand uh, Ethiopian uh, have some flights uh, from Atlanta. Uh, so I hope after this meeting, the first fly, uh, business people to, uh, to, to Mozambique and to Africa will start from Atlanta, taking advantage of the new line connection. So the visa uh, process is there, uh, open, and it's much faster. Like I said, the assessment of the first six months is very positive. Uh, we have more and more people, and uh, the process is faster. The, uh, other issues has to make uh, the environment much more friendly. This is happening not only in Mozambique, but in many countries in Southern Africa and also in, in, in Africa. 
the process of having one stop instead of just getting there and go through all this uh, uh, process of desk by desk you you get the information you get the help starting from our embassy in washington dc uh, i have here the commercial commercial advisor he is right there uh, he can help you on how to do that so um, the, the, the reason, again, I'm introducing you to him is that I want you to engage and uh, for sure a follow-up uh, uh, action will come up. Uh, Godinho, uh, I think over by the weekend we'll have some people already flying to Mozambique <laughs> to, to, to do business. Uh, the other area is that tax, tax uh, reforms. You know, uh, the taxes have been reduced. Before it was only for big business. Now you have medium and smaller uh, business uh, having this tax waiver, taking benefit of industrial free, uh, free, free areas uh, in Mozambique. Like I said, this is not a, 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 a process that is taking place only in Mozambique, but in many, many other uh, countries in Africa. Just to make it sure that uh, if you have benefits from the industrial free zones in Mozambique, uh, you want to expand. The, 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 the extent of your business, you can also uh, go to uh, uh, other countries. I can give you a very quick example of the Kruger Park, uh, which uh, enca encapsulates parts of Mozambique, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. So now we have what we call uh, a, a, a tourist visa. You can visit all those three places with just a single visa. Now you don't need a visa from one you can move to all, 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 all others, just like the animals are doing in those parks, in that park. <laughs> this is a true story. They stay in South Africa, but when they need water, they cross into Mozambique for water. And then they graze somewhere in Zimbabwe. So if you put all these barriers, you are disturbing their uh, uh, ecosystem. You open up and then you move. We are reasoning animals, so we just have to see what's happening in nature and we follow that. <laughs> so this is one more reason. When I was... Uh, I, I, th I think you're going to have to start wrapping that question because we have very... we're basically almost at time. Okay. It didn't raise the... the, the, <laughs> the, the <laughs> there around. it is. <laughs> Good. Now, to, to wrap my point, <laughs> you bear with me. Uh, you know, uh, how to attract investment. Our task here, I'll just put it in two sentences. Uh, my task, and we Africans, uh, the first part is that we are here to make more and more friends. We have some friends, but we need more and more friends. And the outcome of that is the second sentence that I'm bringing, is to uh, uh, promote more and more partnership. That's what we are, we are here uh, uh, to do. So uh, we have a dialogue, but then we have to come with partnership. And those partnerships have to move to the implementation side where we can do things uh, together. Just finally, to, to bridge on what uh, Glenn said, uh, about the diaspora. People say in Africa, uh, home is never far. Wherever you might be, if you want to go home, it will never be far, too far for you. So the African diaspora and Africa descendants, uh, when they think about doing business in Africa, they are the right uh, uh, segment because it's like going home, so you are never too far. And investors, they don't want to put their money in a strange environment and you are the right people. If you don't have that money, talk to those who have that money to uh, take and invest in Africa. And UCDA has been doing well in that, and we thank you uh, for that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Mvunga. So you, you heard it here. If you're going for tourism or for business, no visa required, right? <laughs> 
we'll, we'll follow up with the ambassador just to make sure. But that goes to show you how you know countries on the continent and even at the African Union level are encouraging more and more investment and travel to um, for the to the continent and specifically for Mozambique. But also this concept of a one-stop shop for investors to go in and if you land in you know on the ground and you don't know which way to go in terms of investment, the government has a one-stop shop set up for investors to point you in the right direction. So thank you, Ambassador Mbunga. Uh, last but not least, and, and we are um, sort of almost out of time, um, Brandon, if you could just talk about, um, you know, I, I'm aware that the U.S. government has many initiatives designed to promote a stronger economic engagement with African countries, especially in the area of infrastructure development, as you mentioned. Can you tell us about some of these initiatives briefly and the role that um, USTD, USTDA plays uh, and how your agency works with U.S. companies uh, to generate sheer prosperity for the United States and Africa. Absolutely. Um, just like the ambassador said, um, the diaspora-led businesses, um, you know, bring a special expertise. Um, diaspora-led businesses bring special relationships, and it's ultimately coming home. So, and, you know, with that, you know, our partners, our overseas partners, they're looking for the best that U.S. companies have to offer. And diaspora-led businesses and minority-led businesses are those businesses. So USTDA works hard to get uh, these opportunities in front of uh, you know, folks that can really do stuff in terms of infrastructure development. Because um, these opportunities, you know, in, especially when you think about international relations, sometimes we, 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 we often don't reach out to the folks that need to be at the table. And so uh, Director Abang, the head of our agency, has made a, a strong effort to make sure we are at conferences, we're reaching out to uh, local communities, and I do want to plug our Making Global Local Partnership that you can subscribe to. You can start getting our newsletters. You can start getting our information. Um, like I said before, you know, we are bringing businesses to you, right? And so that's one way of, you know, to increase the shared prosperity. You know, when U.S. companies, you know, do a project for, you know, telehealth, you know, that's a win-win for the U.S. company. Also, too, for the folks that actually need telehealth. Um, so that's just another example of, you know, how we are cr creating shared prosperity. And, you know, I'm going to say it again. Please check out our website. We have a lot of information that you can use. And like I said, if you don't particularly do infrastructure, I'm sure you know someone that does. And, you know, we also, you know, do feasibility studies. I know a lot of small to medium businesses do feasibility studies. My parents are architects. so. You know, I remember, you know, them doing different studies. I know, you know, they, they, they ran a two-person, three-person shop. So, you know, when we think about infrastructure, it doesn't have to be a, a large-scale corporation. You know, we do grant studies for feasibility studies, desk studies. Um, so please, like I said, um, check out our information. Also, too, USTDA is a small agency. You know, you're one phone call away from decision makers. You know, you're one email away from decision makers. So, you know, after this panel, um, I, would, I would love to, you know, talk to a few folks. I will pass out my, my business card with my email. So just please uh, come engage. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brandon. And thank you all, all to all my distinguished panelists um, for talking about the opportunities um, on the continent for investors uh, and diaspora engagement. Thank you. And we will now turn back over to you, Kendra. Thank you to our really outstanding panel for putting a lot of key issues on the table um, and really whetting the appetite for the how-to stories we're about to hear next. I'd be remiss if I didn't know that um, CD is a, represent a representative of PepsiCo, represents our chair company of the U.S. Africa Business Center, 
On our next panel, we're going to hear from our vice chair company, Flutterwave. So these aren't just individuals here speaking uh, from uh, an intellectual standpoint. These are companies that are really walking the talk, and we're honored that you'll be able to hear from another round of companies uh, that are living that dream as well. So I'd like to invite my colleague, Rick Wade, Senior Vice President for Strategic Alliances and Outreach to the stage, as he will lead our next conversation with our next panel, Making a Dream of Reality, How Can Diaspora Businesses um, how can diaspora build business linkages um, to the African markets? So Rick, please join me on stage. Okay, let's make the dream a reality. I'm Rick Wade, Senior Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and it's great to be with you. Let's welcome our distinguished panelists up to the stage, Rahama Wright, please join us. Rahama is <laughs> President and CEO of Shea Yelene. And we hear more about her company in just a moment. Almas Nagash, I believe is here. The Africa Diaspora Network. And Bankule Falade is here <laughs> with the company Flutterway. You know, it was said earlier, and I agree, having spent a significant amount of time on the continent, uh, I, I, I do believe that Africa uh, is the future of the world's economy. Uh, when you think about the average age of 19 years of age and all of the rich opportunities, I was there in this past December with my good friend Boris Kojo and others doing their full circle economic summit. And there's something for everybody because I'm rocking this new line of suits I'm going to start <laughs> selling, the safari suit, which you can wear, uh, Ambassador uh, Patrick Gaspar, to the White House. You can wear it to corporate America. I wear it in the U.S. Chamber. And it's about demystifying, even clothing. So I am excited to be here and talk about how we make the dream a reality. L let, me, let me first ask a question of our panelists about how you think about the diaspora and the role of the diaspora in facilitating opportunities to do business across the continent. Let's start with you. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you to the Chamber for having me as part of this conversation. My name is Rahma Wright. I'm the founder of Shayaline, and what my company does, we butter people up. So <laughs> we help women in um, West Africa, Ghana specifically, take this seed and transform it into a body care product and connect that product to U.S. retailers like Whole Foods, Macy's. And through the supply chain that we've built, we help increase women's income five times their country's minimum wage, giving them a living wage for the very first time. So to answer your question, <laughs> thank you. So to, so to answer your question um, and how I define the diaspora, I think we are all the diaspora, everyone in this room, right? Whether you were born in America or born in Africa, if you have heritage or can point back to the continent as a place of origin, you are part of the diaspora. And the diaspora has an incredibly important role in advancing um, economic and political development on the continent. I started my company in my early 20s with absolutely no business background. And to the, what CD was saying earlier, I didn't have networks, I didn't have any money, I had just come back to the US after serving in the Peace Corps. Um, and so I was really broke and I had just left working in a village and seeing so many things in Mali where I felt that there was huge opportunity. So despite having all of these check marks against me, um, I felt compelled to start my business because I saw it as an opportunity to address systemic issues um, in Africa and in a very specific supply chain. And so it was that connection, you know, being of African heritage, having the connection as a first generation Ghanaian American. And that's what the diaspora has to offer. Being on the continent is not just simply being a tourist, but we have that emotional connection to wanting to do, um, make a positive difference in the communities that we visit and we are a part of. And I just want to say that it's so important that when we talk about advancing Africa, Africa cannot advance without women being a part of every single economic and political system. 
and the foundation of my business is how do we include women who historically have been on the fringes, who historically have not been included in economic development and have not been able to take advantage of the finance, financials that are built off of their labor. And so I think, again, this is what the diaspora brings to the table. We have that connection where it's not simply about doing business transactions, but it's about how we build businesses, who is a part of those businesses, and how can we make sustained social and economic impact in a positive way. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you. And thank you for all that you do, Rama. Her story is amazing and what she's doing in Washington, D.C to create incubators for women on enterprises. Um, how about you? I mean, you're with you, you, Africa Diaspora Network, so you know this stuff, so. <laughs> well, she was asking, she was telling me why we need this. Yeah, no, it's good to be here. Um, the same question. Yes, please. Thank you, the Chamber, for having us. This is wonderful conversation. Well, I started the African Diaspora Network actually out of frustration. I am, uh, I live in Silicon Valley. My husband is an engineer. We both came as a foreign student to the United States. And I felt like I was the only black woman in every place I go and I became an advisor to a lot of wonderful social entrepreneurs, my white wonderful friends. And I keep asking, you are doing this work in Africa and you don't have an African person in this committee or in your bitch, oh, but we, we have you but I'm only one. So I think I became a nugging person and I just said, okay, why am I asking people to invite me? What if we invite people? Because you see, I think CD mentioned and you just mentioned the Rama, network is very important. It was important to me, it continues to be important to everyone. And that's how we started the idea was, how can we bring Africans and friends of Africa together as one family in one umbrella, which is ridiculous because it's 54 countries as the continent, and then you've got other countries with it. And everyone says, no, it's not going to work because Pan-Africanism never worked. And I, I refuse to believe that, simply because I don't think that's true. Pan-Africanism worked. We just didn't know how it was working, and we were not really aware of the roots of what I'm actually about to do or what I'm doing. So I think networking and bringing the diaspora has been the greatest gift that keeps giving. Um, so we are now 13 years old, probably one of the oldest in a way from a contemporary diaspora like myself, that we started this as an idea. Now we are about seven full-time people and about 10 to 15 contractors. And the, the network is 10,000 plus, and it's Africans and Friends of Africa. We usually get together every year in Silicon Valley. Why do we do that? because we saw the value of connecting with each other. It's very horizontal. The CEO comes and meets with a young entrepreneur. The person says to him, I am doing this in Zimbabwe or in Kenya. And then one Nigerian guy, and this is a real story. I want to invest in you. So last year at the symposium, two Yali Mandela fellows got $10,000 each from one Nigerian investor just by meeting them and instantly gravitated to, toward their business, and we know he continues to support them. These kinds of networks are so critical to the diaspora, simply because opportunities are everywhere, but access to opportunity is not everywhere. So how do you provide access to opportunity? I do believe what we do provides access to opportunity. What value do we, the diaspora, bring to the community? I think at the core of what we bring is ourself. The fact that you can represent yourself as who you are and be able to connect with each other in itself is actually the beginning of what you can do in the future. Mm -hmm. The other thing we do is knowledge exchange. It's not just sharing, it's exchanging of knowledge. Knowledge is not just owned by few, it's actually abundant. And the fact that I actually said the same thing, advanced with Africa last night, we have a brief conversation, I said, you, may, you saying with, change the narrative because everything has been for Africa. For how can we help Africa? You don't have to help Africa. Africans can help themselves. But you just have to open up the door and really allow them to step in. Mm -hmm. And I think this is the beginning of that conversation. But in terms of opportunities, I'm sure we can talk. This is really what I love. It's getting people together and then co collaborating and co-creating. Those are critical things for anybody, but especially for the diaspora. And all of us uh, in, in, in the community, I think we need this kind of connection. Thank you. Thank you.
Kelly, t t talk to us in, uh, about Flutter Wave and how do you fit in, in your company into this whole ecosystem of the diaspora? Right. Um, thank you very much to the PACEDI and the U.S. Chamber for having us here. Uh, Flutter Wave is a payments technology company founded in 2016. Uh, we're headquartered out of San Francisco. Our base of operations are in Lagos, Nigeria. We've extended to over 30 countries on the continent. I was just saying to the ambassador from Mozambique that was in Maputo in November to apply for a license to process payments um, in Mozambique as well. Um, what we've done at Flutter Wave is to connect the 30 countries that we have reached to in Africa now and make that one big super highway for making payments. Um, so we've, today we facilitate cross-border payments and domestic payments across the continent of Africa. What we do very well is we have enabled a lot of businesses owned by foreigners, owned by Americans, owned by diasporas to collect and make payments on the continent. We also facilitate remittances. We allow people, we say we allow people put their money where their hearts are. We enable you send money back home to Africa, uh, secure convenience, and we make sure that, you know, your money gets to the recipients almost instantly. In terms of, you know, big businesses and small businesses, um, if you've been to men, any major, well, most of the major cities in Africa today, so if you take an Uber ride in, in Lagos, you take one in Accra, in Nairobi, in Johannesburg, 95% of the times that payment is processed by Flutterwave. Um, so we continue to enable businesses like Uber Expand, um, enable businesses like Netflix. Netflix is doing a lot of great work on the continent now with local movies, local content. Um, subscribers who make payments on platforms like that, you know, use Flutterwave at the back end. Um, we've also continue to enable lots of small startup companies, you know, with not just payments, but with, you know, payment advisory services and helping them to connect to, you know, their peers, uh, connect them to mentors, also connect them, you know, in terms of ensuring they understand, you know, the right regulatory frameworks and what it is to do business on, on, the, on the continent. Um, so at, at, at Flutterwave, we, we know that, you know, the diaspora will continue on one, you know, want to connect with Africa, either from a cultural perspective, entrepreneurial spirits, or even emotional connections. And we are there as an enabler to enable you, you know, do business on the continent of Africa. Um, payments is very extremely important. If you want to do business, you want to be able to bring your money in, take your money out, and we've got the right infrastructure that connects you and enables you to do that successfully. Thank you. You, thank you, thank you. You, you know, one of the um, things I try to help uh, businesses, particularly SMEs and across America, understand that 95% of the world's consumers actually live outside of the United States. And as you think of how you started Shea Yaleen mm -hmm. and your expansion and how you scale and how you reach consumers and customers, uh, what, what has been your greatest challenge uh, in, do you think about scalability and your ability to really grow your enterprise? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, being in a consumer packaged goods industry and being in the beauty space and personal wellness space, one of the biggest challenges for companies like mine is manufacturing. The reality is you can't sell what you can't make. And the way that manufacturing is designed, it's not designed for small business. It's designed for large businesses. So let's say someone in this audience wants to start a hair care line or a, a beard line or create facial serums. Where would you go to make your products? Many people are making it in their homes, in their home basements, their home kitchens. And we hear stories like Carol's daughter, right? She started in her home and then she was able to scale and grow eventually. And that barrier to market entry has been an ongoing challenge for me personally and also for other businesses um, that are in the beauty space, the indie beauty space. So one of the things that I'm working on now is actually in Washington, D.C., we're building the first commercial shared manufacturing facility for early stage beauty entrepreneurs run by 
black women and women of color as a way to address that market barrier to entry. Um, it'll be a one-stop shop where entrepreneurs can come in and access not only the technical know-how, because you know there's chemistry involved. So being able to connect to a cosmetic chemist, being able to talk to a branding specialist, or someone who does packaging, figuring out how to source your ingredients. And the beautiful thing is, I've been working on ingredient sourcing from African countries for almost two decades. So instead of having these small businesses try to figure it out themselves, they can activate the supp supply chain I've already built. And this is where we go from making incremental impact to transform transformational impact and really accelerating our level of impact because now it's going from just working with a handful of uh, villages and a handful of women to working with thousands of women in many villages and not only sourcing shea butter but also sourcing moringa from Uganda or argon from Morocco and it's that value addition that happens first on the continent and then that transformation into retail ready products that happens through our manufacturing facility that's going to address some of these pain points. Thank you. Thank you. I want, let me go back to this, the, the, the understanding of that diaspora. Um, I'm struck when I travel across the country and even to the continent uh, about and, and I think it perhaps is rooted in lack of knowledge and understanding. But what I don't see enough, even in the United States, are the collaborations. Uh, I mean, there's a large Nigerian business population in Houston, and there are pockets all over the United States, but I don't see the cross-collaboration among us within the diaspora who live in the United States. There are 2.6 million black-owned businesses in the country, and the opportunities to collaborate with our brothers and sisters across the continent who live here. What are some practical ways in which we can bridge that gap so that it leads to better and stronger business ties and relationships? I love this question. Thank you. <laughs> I love this question because it has always been a challenge. And I'd rather give you the real example and then see where that might take us in the future. So in 2020, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, one of the largest foundations in Silicon Valley, they came to the African Diaspora Investment Symposium and they looked at what we were doing with a program we call the Builders of Africa's Future. These are young entrepreneurs that we bring from uh, the continent. They pitch to the community and then usually they get some money, not a lot, but then eventually someone starts to look at them and invest in them. C. Diglin is one of the first people who actually saw what we were doing and start to fund us eventually. What I, uh, the, this uh, senior woman from the, uh, uh, member of the uh, leadership from the foundation, she came to me and said, Almaz, you have these amazing young entrepreneurs that you're supporting from the continent. What about here in the United States? How about the black entrepreneurs in the United States? So it was my big mouth and I said, sure give us the seed funding, I will be very happy to develop the program, and I'm not kidding you, we just did just that. She gave us a very small amount of money to develop the concept of developing, we call it accelerating black leadership and entrepreneurship, ABLE. You can go to our website and take a look at it. Several of them are actually in Atlanta. So what we were trying to do was, how can we then open up this accelerator program for African Americans, so we're talking about the historical diaspora, that have not really had a chance to connect with the contemporary diaspora, with, with people like myself. How do we make this happen? We got funding from Bill. Bill is the fintech company in Silicon Valley, is the lead funder of the program, the Accelerating Black Leadership uh, and Entrepreneurship Program. It was seed funded by Silicon Valley Community Foundation. Talk about partnership. And then we went out and got a lead funding from Bill, another fintech company, and their own family foundation makes this possible. Every year, we've been supporting black entrepreneurs and African uh, diasporans. So what are we trying to do? We're not just only accelerating or helping the businesses here from black, black community, but they're also working in terms of the, uh, the, uh, the contemporary diaspora and the historical diaspora right now are under the ABLE program. Both of them working together, collaborating, and trying to figure out opportunities as access to trade in other parts of the continent. That I think is for me, I don't know how else to think, but to do it this way and allow them to figure out 
to uh, collaborate and partner with them. Unless we give them the platform, entrepreneurs will not be able to succeed easily. But bringing them together actually behooves them to figure out what I don't know in the US, somebody else will help me. But what I don't know how to do in Uganda, I do have this partner who's going to be working with me. So we're trying to create that collaboration between black entrepreneurs in the United States and those on the continent. It's a, it's a start, but it's a start nonetheless that's very, very important and comes back to the question that you've asked. How do we, the only way you can bridge the divide is by bringing people together. There's no other way. I don't know how else to do it. Yeah. You build a relationship, you build trust, then action follows. I've never seen anything happen for me outside these three things. And when I say relationship, not a relationship as a means to an end, but as a means in itself. So once you really take that as serious issue for yourself and what you're trying to do, for some reason, something else keeps coming and keeps coming. And we just, all of us, have to try to make that happen. And whenever we do business with the continent or with the United States, we need to have something in our head that says, Am I really doing this intentionally so I can really open up the space for the African entrepreneurs on the continent to work with black entrepreneurs in the United States? That is critical, and that I see is as an opportunity. Not one, the only thing, but one way we can really bridge the divide. Mm -hmm. well, well, thank you very much, thank you. Uncle, let me end with this, with, with one question for you, please. Um, it, because I think all of this requires a real public-private collaboration. You know, there's one thing if you could, I guess, speak to the heads of states of all the countries on the continent and even the heads of the United States. What is the one thing that government should be doing more of as you think about digital payments and technology and AI, regulatory, regulatory frameworks, creating that enabling environment, uh, but from the technology side or digital side? How do you, what is the one thing that you think is most important for the public sector? Um, so thank you for the question. So, so I think um, if, if I were to answer that, you know, um, what I would say is, well, what is extremely important is collaboration with the private sector. And when I use the term private sector, I, I do that loosely with, you know, to include entrepreneurs in this room and people watching all over, not just big firms and established companies. Um, what you find is that, you know, usually government has the will but the private sector comes in and is able to demonstrate the commitment, take that will beyond just an idea and make it a, rea a reality. Um, and if we're addressing the audience in this room, you know, I, I think what we need, where we would need you know, the Africans in diaspora to assist in those conversations would be, you know, one, to you know, support government efforts here in the US, so support the work that you know, the PAC ADA is doing um, there are many opportunities that a body like the PAC ADA get involved in conversations at the African Union level on the, you know, conversations around Africa con continental free trade agreement, get involved in conversations around AGOA, get involved in conversations around, you know, general policy matters as well. Also, you know, like I said earlier, put your money where your heart is, mm -hmm. invest on the continent, you know, come back to the continent. There are many opportunities. There are many things we need in, on the continent in Africa, mainly where, where you can support will be with, you know, your skills, your expertise, um, you know, cross-pollinate with fellow experts and contemporaries on the continent as well. And, and you know, I'm, I'm, I, I think if we can get all of that done, um, you know, Africa would be probably one of the greatest continents on, on, on the planet today. Yeah. Hey. Lightning rod, 10 seconds, one word, two words, three words. What are you most optimistic about when it comes to Africa and the diaspora? I am optimistic about our ability to create new systems that center our needs and address our issues. And the, the reality is if something is not working, we have to change it. And we change it with new and better systems. And I also appreciate the fact that the conversation about Africa has gotten so expansive. It's, you know, we're changing the perception of what can happen on the continent, and we're not waiting for others to drive it. We're driving it ourselves. Yeah. I'm a please. The same thing. I am actually very excited and interested in to see even where this takes us, but the generosity of the diaspora, we don't speak about this a lot, but I am 
amazed and proud of the amazing support that the diaspora is giving to each other, mm -hmm. to their community, and we really are changing the narrative as we go. I don't believe in narrative changing by just saying it. You have to show it. What are we changing? And I think we're living by example, and I'm very proud of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think for me, um, in parting, I, I would say, you know, beyond what the PAC ADA is doing, I think there are many other opportunities for the diaspora to get involved on the continent, um, support with ideas, support with, you know, provide moral support, provide policy support, and there are many opportunities. The continent provides lots of opportunities, and with those opportunities also come challenges as well. And I think the diaspora can really help bridge that gap. You can continue to be uh, ambassadors in, in the U.S. and ensure that, you know, uh, Africa gets the right level of support in it. Thank you. Good. Give it up for this great panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you for joining me. Thank you. Thank you to that tremendous panel. I, I heard the words enablers. I heard um, that we are showing, not telling. And certainly, I think that these great leaders gave us an excellent example of what is possible. Now we're going to have an opportunity to hear a little bit more about how to make those, those dreams implementable. And that information will come from our sponsoring partner, DLA Piper. We're really pleased to have with us um, Ms. Nana Frimpong, who serves as the co-chair of the Africa Practice and is a partner with DLA Piper. And she's going to talk with us a little bit about how do we uh, take that next step in doing business with the continent. Notice there was a little pause in Kendra um, referencing what I was going to be talking about because I think it'll actually be slightly different. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for um, coming to this event. I really want to thank, um, really a special thank you to the chamber, not only for their leadership and their foresight with this Advance with Africa series to spearhead this, to think about this but also uh, to thank the members of the President's Advisory Council for African Diaspora Engagement who are here today. Uh, my name is Nanda Frimpong. As Kendra mentioned, I am the co-chair of the U.S. Africa Practice um, at DLA Piper, which is a global law firm with 40 countries we operate out of in the world. What's particularly special about DLA to me is that we are unique among global law firms in that we have an unrivaled footprint on the African continent. We operate out of 20 different African countries. And this presence is not extractive. I love the reference someone made to advance with Africa. It's not extractive in its orientation, seeking to take from Africa, but it is a partnership and one that's shaped by collaboration, capacity building, and knowledge transfer. As someone with Ghanaian parents who has spent her elementary and high school years in Ghana and Botswana, and then college and law school here in the United States. I felt that both my personal and my professional journeys have been essentially a bridge builder between Africa and the United States. And I've heard this as a theme today, the idea of a bridge builder. So you can imagine just how thrilled I was to hear that President Biden was establishing the PAC ADA. We've heard about the remittances and how significant the power of the African diaspora is, even with that lens alone. Remittances can account in some countries for significant portions of, of their GDP. But it's the latent power of the broader African diaspora represented here today that is yet untapped. And I'm so thrilled about the efforts here to organize this group and think critically about how to unleash the breadth of this potential. This gathering here is also timely because it gives me an opportunity to introduce my co-chair of the U.S. Africa practice. He just joined our law firm this past Friday, and we're incredibly lucky to have the former general counsel of the African Development Bank, Kaledu Gadio, join our firm and bring the wealth. <laughs> Thank you for that. He brings the wealth of his experience spanning the entire African continent to bear in support of our clients. And 
For those of you who work in and with the continent, the African Development Bank has played a pivotal role in directing much needed private investment into the African continent. And many of those creative and novel approaches you may all be aware of, such as the African Legal Support Facility, which provides a lot of capacity building opportunities for African governments, Africa 50, Shelter Afrique, and many other initiatives are ones which Kaladu spearheaded and was responsible for during his tenure. He's a true son of the African soil, a statistic I find breathtaking is similar to one we heard earlier today. Someone else said they, of the 54 African countries, he's been to 48. So I know I speak for many at our firm to say we're just so incredibly to, lucky to have him join us. I'll just end my remarks really with this comment. I believe the breadth of opportunity for the US and for Africa is enormous. But there has to be more purposeful, sustained and full engagement. And you've heard about the ways in which you can think about both collaborating, connecting um, with uh, uh, entrepreneurs on the African continent and so forth. America has often felt a step behind where many other countries are in their purposeful engagement with the continent. We've seen in the last year or so senior officials from the Biden administration making trips to the continent and we're hopeful 2024 means uh, President Biden himself will go to the continent. And the vision for our US Africa practice is to leverage that unrivaled presence on the continent that I spoke about to support our US based clients with their investment needs into Africa and our Africa based clients with their investment and in other needs vis-a-vis -vis the US. We applaud the effort here. It is so important. We heard earlier um, today and from various um, speakers about the importance of what is being done on the continent and not seeing Africa as uh, some place that just needs help. Many of the things that are happening, we heard about mobile money, are solutions that actually impact the world. Out of scarcity, Africans through connect, uh, their ingenuity, their innovation, come up with solutions that solve the world's problems. That's why you can you send money by Zelle today because the lack of infrastructure um, on, on its sort of financial, traditional financial infrastructure of banks led to the ability to use mobile money. So I, I, I think it's just important to have that perspective. I heard this phrase that I loved um, from a former colleague, made in Africa for the world. That's, that's what this is, an opportunity for us to come together to ensure that we're creating the circumstances that what's made in Africa actually is beneficial to the world. So our firm stands ready to support those who seek to engage in what is this two-way investment flow between US and Africa. Thank you. Thank you again, Nana, for, for those inspiring words and for um, being there as a resource for those who are seeking uh, additional ways to connect with the continent. I know we are just at time, but we are going to have our closing remarks. Um, but since Nana referenced resources and we had a panelist who said, come see me after, I want to make sure that I have those uh, officials who are here from the U.S. government, from Small Business Administration and other institutions who are in the room, who can also be resources to wave a hand so entrepreneurs can know who to reach um, with the, as they have questions. We've got a, a great group here. Um, and so after these closing remarks, you know that you can find those colleagues uh, to get additional information. And so with that, I'd like to invite up the Executive Director of the President's Advisory Council for African Diaspora Engagement, Denise Laurent Manti, who not only was, as you heard, in the room and not devising uh, this council, but has really honored us at the chamber by enabling us to partner for today's event. Denise, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Even with heels, I have to bring it down. Uh, <laughs> but thank you, Kendra, and thank you to the entire uh, Chamber of Commerce team for partnering with us today. Um, so as we draw the curtains on this great gathering, and just overall a great productive day that we've had since morning, um, I stand here profoundly inspired by the collective commitment and vision demonstrated by our members, the African diaspora community, and of course our private sector partners. 
Throughout our discussions, we've delved into the critical importance of fostering stronger linkages between the African diaspora and the vibrant markets across the African continent. We've explored the boundless opportunities that lie in building bridges of collaboration, leveraging our collective expertise, and nurturing the innovative business ideas and models of investment that should be mutually beneficial. Indeed, the African diaspora embodies a powerful force, hence why we've established the council, and it's a force for economic growth and development on the continent. We bring a wealth of knowledge, experience, and networks that are indispensable in driving sustainable investment and entrepreneurship across the continent. So from the, from the walls of Wall Street, the bustling markets of Lagos, from the tech hubs of Silicon Valley, to the emerging startups ecosystems of Nairobi, the diaspora's imprint is unmistakable. Yet our work is far from over, it's just the beginning. And as we reflect on each discussion that we've had throughout the day and the insights shared today, let us be reminded of the immense potential that awaits us. Let us seize the moment to redouble our efforts in fostering greater collaboration, innovation, and investment between the diaspora and African markets. Together we have the power to really define the narrative of Africa's economic landscape. And we also have the power to unlock the new pathways for growth, prosperity, and a shared opportunity. But it is going to require action, uh, strategic action, unwavering dedication, and a steadfast commitment of partnership when it comes to our work on the council, but of course with, with the diaspora and our private sector partners. So we hope to engage, empower, and uplift one another. And in closing, I want to extend a heartfelt gratitude to each and every one of you for joining us today, but also for our members who took time out of their busy schedule to spend the entire day with us. Thank you all so much for your time. And to Dr. Gale for hosting us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gale, <laughs> President of Spelman College for hosting us. Um, it's been an honor to be here in Atlanta for our first planning meeting as, as a council. And so let us march forward together with renewed vigor, determination, knowing that the best is yet to come. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Denise. Thanks so very much uh, for those warm words. Um, I do want to add just a few words of, of closing as we wrap. Um, but I'd be remiss if I didn't start by thanking the incredible leaders who have spent their time imparting insights with us today, uh, the uh, ambassador, the executives, the members of the President's Advisory Council. You heard talk of the importance of capital, of building connections, of collaborating, of really enhancing capacity. You heard talk of an ecosystem where small and medium enterprises are working with big business and making long commitments to connect. You heard about ingenuity that is changing our lives here in the United States and the ability to build bridges with one another. And so we call, as we close today, call on all of you to consider how you can play a part in that bridge building. Um, and so with that, I'd like to thank again our incredible speakers, um, thank the gathering spot for being an excellent host, DLA Piper, for their contributions to today's engagement, um, to our U.S. government officials who waved their hand that you'll get to meet as we close, um, to the members of the U.S. Africa Business Council, the leadership, the board, the members that traveled to be here today, to our elected leaders who joined us, and most importantly, those of you who are entrepreneurs who took time out of toiling to build businesses to be here to learn about another chapter that you could add to your work. We thank you. We appreciate your participation and we look forward to working closely with you. So with that, I say thank you and good afternoon.